Today it's a um, combinatorial uh, rigidity talk, or even graph theory, if you want. Um, so I, I don't think I have to uh, define the basics uh, on, on the fourth day of this meeting. Um, just uh, let me recall that um, rigidity and global rigidity of uh, frameworks in RD is a generic property. So there exists a rigid or globally rigid generic framework if and only if every generic framework is in RD is rigid or globally rigid. Uh, these are basic results. And uh, therefore we can uh, define uh, two families of graphs for every fixed D. Uh, we can define rigid graphs. Um, they are the graphs for which some or equivalently every generic framework in RD is rigid and we can define globally rigid graphs uh, in a similar manner. And uh, you know very well that, uh, so it, it is one of, one of the major targets to characterize rigid and globally rigid graphs in RD for every D. But um, so far, uh, combinatorial characterizations are known only for D equals one and two. Okay, and in case you are really new to the subject, uh, here is a, a figure for you, uh, two-dimensional generic frameworks. The uh, first one on the left is, is not rigid. The second one is rigid, but not globally rigid. You can see the uh, third one is a, an equivalent, but non-congruent non realization of the second one. And the fourth one on the right is, is globally rigid in, in R2. Uh, okay, now. Let's start the warm-up observations for, for today's topic. So first of all, uh, you know, it's a, a, a very old observation, probably due to Maxwell, that if G is rigid in the plane, then the number of edges is at least uh, two times the number of vertices minus three. And uh, also well known that the uh, we can, this, uh, attain equality, uh, the minimally rigid graphs in the plane satisfy that the number of edges is equal to 2v minus 3. Okay, but now let's, let's increase the uh, uh, redundancy of the graph with respect to edge uh, deletions. So it's also a well-known concept. So a graph is said to be redundantly rigid or today two edge rigid in RD if G minus E is rigid for uh, every edge. So if we remove any edge from the graph, then it is still rigid. Now from the previous uh, inequality, uh, the second observation is, is uh, obvious that if we have a two edge rigid graph in R2 in the plane, then the number of edges is at least uh, two V minus two. And we may ask whether we can have equality. And of course, of course it's a, uh, uh, we do have equality for every uh, rigidity circuit in the plane. In particular, if we look, consider the wheel graphs on at least four vertices, then they are, they are two edge rigid in the plane, easy to see, and they have exactly two V minus two edges. So we can conclude that uh, for uh, two edge rigid graphs in the plane, the smallest number of edges in terms of the number of vertices is, is, is 2v minus two. And this is tight for every uh, v at least four. Now, it's more interesting if we, uh, becomes more interesting if we consider uh, vertex deletions. So we can define a two vertex rigidity. The graph is two vertex rigid in RD. If g minus v is rigid for all vertices v, of the graph. So the next question uh, in this sequence uh, to ask is how about, what, what is a, a tight lower bound? So if G is two vertex rigid in R2, then uh, uh, we would like to have a, a lower bound that we can attain by, uh, by an infinite family of graphs. So it's, it's not so obvious, it's not so obvious. Um, it might be the case that we have even minimally rigid graphs, which are two vertex rigid, or maybe redundantly rigid graphs, which are two vertex rigid, for example, 
this is not not one of them. It's a uh, it's a two edge rigid graph, the the same wheel graph, but it is not two vertex rigid. If we remove the center vertex, then then we obtain a cycle. So it's not it's not um, <clears throat> two vertex rigid. So well, one may one may think about this, uh, and uh, and and it is possible to determine the tight uh, bound. And this is the first the first theorem uh, in this. Uh, uh, in this context, and it's due to Brigitte, uh, 1989. So she proved that uh, um, if um, we have a uh, two vertex rigid graph in the plane, on at least seven vertices, then it has at least two n minus one edges, and this bound is tight. For every n, at least seven, she gave a um, uh, she constructed a graph with two n minus one edges, which is two vertex rigid. You can see some, you can see two graphs which uh, which are uh, uh, which attain this uh, uh, number. Okay, so then I think it is it is quite natural to to increase the uh, uh, redundancy edge or vertex redundancy, and ask uh, similar questions. So in order to ask these similar questions, let me introduce. Uh, the corresponding uh, definitions that you may guess. So we call a graph K vertex rigid or K vertex globally rigid in RD. If G minus X is rigid or globally rigid um, for every subset of vertices of cardinality at most K minus one, right? So this is consistent with the uh, previous uh, uh, notation. So two Remember that two edge rigid, okay, two vertex rigid means that we can remove one vertex and uh, maintain rigidity. So K vertex rigid means that we can remove up to K minus one vertices. And the same for global rigidity. And then we can introduce the same definition for edge removal. We call a graph K edge rigid or K edge globally rigid uh, if this is satisfied uh, for edge sets. So we can remove up to k minus one edges and uh, maintain rigidity. And the extremal problem that we obtain here is, uh, is this. So we, we would like to determine the minimum number of edges of a k vertex or k edge rigid or globally rigid graph on n vertices in RD given k, n, and d. So K is the level of uh, redundancy and the number of vertices and D is the dimension. So Brigitte solved the special case when K is two, N is N and the D is also two. And, uh, uh, and she, she, she uh, solved the um, uh, vertex rigid version. So you can see that here we have actually four different versions, vertex or edge deletion, and uh, rigidity or global rigidity. And we shall call uh, the uh, extremal graphs, graphs with the smallest size for uh, a given n, k, and d, uh, strongly minimal. So we shall talk about strongly minimal k vertex rigid, say. Now, so after Brigitte's result, um, actually nothing happened for, for, for 20 years, probably no, nobody wanted to solve this, this extremal problem. But then uh, 20 years later, a group in, in Australia uh, started uh, looking at uh, this extremal problem because they, uh, they uh, identified two, two motivations. So the first motivation uh, is, uh, um, is a so-called formation uh, uh, control problem. Imagine that we have a group of UAVs uh, flying together in, in three space. And if they want to maintain a given formation, then they do that by preserving some pairwise distances. And um, uh, you can see that the, the formation is stable if and only if the uh, graph of these distances that they maintain is, is rigid. And um, if you want a formation which remains rigid, even after uh, the removal or, or loss of one of the vehicles, then, then, then clearly then you need a two vertex uh, uh, rigid formation. And since it seems to be useful to have a, a, a smallest possible number of uh, uh, distances to, to manage or to maintain, um, 
this uh, XML problem is, is quite natural. Find, uh, uh, design a formation, which is say two vertex rigid in, in three space and has the smallest number of uh, 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 connections or, or distances. So it's, uh, I think it's, it's really a, a valid motivation, of course. Um, and then there is another similar motivation where instead of rigidity, we, we may talk about global rigidity. So uh, most of you know that uh, uh, in, uh, sen in the sensor network localization problem, uh, global rigidity plays uh, an important role. A network uh, <coughs> is localizable uh, given some pairwise distances, if and only if the graph of these distances is globally rigid. And again, we may lose some sensors, uh, uh, battery dies or something happens and then if we still want a uh, localizable network then 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 we should design a um, uh, highly redundantly globally rigid uh, uh, configuration so based on on on, on this uh, this this motivation um this group the this group in Australia, you can see the, the, the authors of, of their papers. They published uh, uh, three papers and they, they uh, determined a few more um, extremal uh, results. I mean, a few more uh, tight bounds. So in this, in this table, in this matrix, it's, it's, a, it's an in, infinite matrix. It has four rows. So you can see uh, uh, the rows correspond to vertex rigidity, edge rigidity, and so on. Columns correspond to the uh, level of redundancy, one, two, three, four, and so on. And now if you look at this matrix, let's, let's, let's have a look. So this is the, the two-dimensional story. So the first column is easy because it's, it's either easy or it follows easy or, or it, is, it is folklore. So uh, two and minus three is just a number of edges of a minimally rigid graph, same in the second row and so on. So the first column is, is easy. The second entry in the first row is Brigitte's result, 2n minus 1. Second entry in the second row is again folklore, it's 2n minus 2. These are the uh, rigidity circuits, uh, minimal redundantly, mini, uh, redundantly rigid graphs of minimum size. And the remaining three entries uh, have been found by, by, by this Australian group. So they, they extended this matrix. And uh, so uh, uh, in, in 2009, we had these nine uh, entries of this big, big matrix. And then and, and I, I wanted to see what, what was going on. So why, why is it so that we, we only know nine entries of this infinite matrix? And then actually um, you can see so the first table is, is the same. It's just a copy of the previous one. And then, and then I, I, I managed to, uh, to fill in this matrix. You can see all the, uh, all the entries. These bounds are, are all tight. Uh, so you can see from the title of my talk that I, I'd like to talk about the three-dimensional case because, because it is a bit more interesting. So I, I will do that. But first, let's, let's have a look at the two-dimensional uh, matrix. So here you can see... Uh, uh, these bounds, and uh, just uh, there's one one interesting phenomenon to to observe. Uh, so if you look at the second table, which is filled, uh, then um, the first few entries in in every row, they are they are numbers. They they could, are given in the following form: two n plus minus some constant, and then after a certain point, it's much bigger. And also in the second row, 2n plus minus a constant, and then suddenly it becomes uh, much bigger. So we shall uh, uh, see the same, observe the same phenomenon also in, in the three-dimensional case. So this is this is the, the uh, sort of the complete story about the uh, uh, two-dimensional extremal problem. And now, now let's let's move to the three-dimensional case. So the three-dimensional case was almost almost never really touched with, 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 with one exception. So here, here at the top, you can see a, a, a somewhat discouraging sentence from, from one, one of the papers by this Australian group. So they, they, they thought that uh, since we do not have a, a three-dimensional uh, Laman theorem, then, then it's probably hopeless to, to 
solve these problems in, in three dimensions. And um, in this new table, which is now, which, which shows the, the three dimensional story, um, you can see, of course, in 3D, the uh, uh, size of a minimally rigid graph, the number of edges is three n minus six. So this is the, actually the first entry in the first row. So of course, this is the absolute minimum even to have a rigid graph, we need three n minus six edges. So again, the first column uh, is, is, is folklore. Um, and uh, so is the second entry in the second row. And, and then, and then a few years after this, this remark, uh, there was a, a paper by, by Victoria uh, Kosanitsky and Chaba Kirai. It was the first sign that maybe the three dimensional uh, version or some three dimensional versions are, are, are tractable, uh, uh, even though we do not have a three dimensional Laman theorem. So they are responsible for the uh, second and third term in the first row. 3n minus 3 and, and 3n. But still, we have yeah, seven entries in, in, this, in this big matrix. Um, so how, how about the three-dimensional case? And this is the main uh, message uh, in, in this talk, that actually the, um, it's, not, it's not too bad. So, so we, can, we can do a lot without, without Laman theorem in, in, in 3D. So the first table is, is a copy of the previous one. And the second table is, 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 is what, what we could do. So we could, we could fill in this uh, infinite matrix um, and um, we could determine the tight bounds for all but four uh, entries in a paper, in a joint paper with Chris uh, Poston and Ryan Roach. They are undergraduate students from the US. Um, so we looked at this, this problem and with these four exceptions where we have an almost tight bound, I will mention these uh, uh, four exceptions maybe later. So with the exception of these four uh, entries, we have, we have uh, all the entries and you can see the same phenomenon that in, a in the first few entries, three n plus minus something constant. And then from a certain point, it will grow and uh, as you will see, it's the, uh, uh, the minimum degree uh, bound will be, uh, will be the tight bound. But it turns out that uh, in, in the first couple of columns, uh, in some sense, every, every entry is a, a different story. So uh, today I will talk about just one entry uh, uh, in detail, which is, um, which is uh, the three and minus four. In, in the second row. So uh, three edge rigidity in three space. And in this uh, talk, I won't have time of course to, to talk about all the other entries, but, um, but the matrix now is, is almost completely filled. What do the epsilons mean? A uh, good point, <laughs> thank you. I wanted to mention <clears throat> that uh, um, um, we have almost tight bounds, meaning that for each of these epsilon, so, okay. So for example, we know that epsilon one, so we know that, uh, <laughs> okay. So the tight bound uh, is between three N plus five and three N plus 20. So epsilon one is an integer between five and 20. And uh, uh, actually epsilon two and epsilon four, uh, uh, in, in those cases, uh, the gap is, is, is just one. We have an, really an almost tight bound. So it means that, yeah, this is what it means, that uh, uh, we have a bound which is uh, almost tight, tight up to a, a constant. Now, before I start talking about three and minus four, I chose the three and minus four because it has connections to other uh, um, results in, in rigidity theory, which may, may be interesting. But before I uh, uh, turn to this uh, particular entry in this, in this matrix, um, let me show you a few general observations. Oh, no, before I show the general observations. Okay, let me convince you that uh, that, that this, this, this problem or these problems are, are actually 
interesting or, or non-trivial. At, at least they turned out to be more interesting than I than I uh, expected. Because because if you want to solve uh, your favorite uh, extremal problem, you want to determine your favorite entry in this matrix, then first you have to come up with a, um, a strong enough lower bound on the number of uh, edges. It is sometimes easy, sometimes not, 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 so, not so obvious. And after determining a strong enough lower bound, then you have to construct an extremal family, a candidate family. So graphs that match this uh, uh, size uh, lower bound, and you have to construct uh, an infinite family. So, so at least uh, uh, one graph for all sufficiently large uh, N. And then, and then, in order to show that the, it is indeed an extremal family, then you have to prove for every graph in this infinite family and for every subset of vertices or edges of size at most k minus one, that if you remove this set, then what you get is still rigid or globally rigid. And now it's a, if if k is large, then it's it's kind of uh, it's not easy. Then then you have uh, you have uh, uh, lots of cases to to worry about, and in particular in in, in three dimensions, um, in some sense we don't know we have no yeah we don't know the characterization of rigid graphs. So you have to you have to uh, solve uh, item three without knowing which graphs are rigid. Um, so it's a challenging, uh, 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 in some sense, a, a graph theoretic uh, problem. Um, so it turns out actually that for, for uh, if k is uh, small, then uh, then the first two items are, are, are more difficult, and then and then the third one is is, is not too bad, and um, and if k is large. Then the lower bounds are, are typically straightforward, but then 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 showing this uh, for every x and for every graph is uh, is the tricky part. Okay. Now, let's see uh, some warm up observations. Uh, so some some useful lemmas first. Uh, so there are some implications that help uh, uh, fill in this matrix. So sometimes if we determine one entry, then, then, then it implies uh, a few more other entries in this matrix. So this uh, observation, uh, so these lemmas, actually they are valid in RD for, for all D and the low dimensional versions had been uh, uh, proved uh, uh, earlier, but but it's nice that they, they work uh, work for, for every d. So k vertex rigid implies k edge rigid. K vertex globally rigid implies k edge globally rigid, and uh, k edge globally rigid implies k plus one edge rigid. It's not very surprising if you know the uh, uh, if you are familiar with uh, the basic theorems in, in rigidity theory, but but you can you can deduce and and use these lemmas, and finally, a k vertex rigid implies k minus one vertex globally rigid. So we also we have if we have implications uh, 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 between these uh, different rows in this in this uh, in infinite matrix. Um, okay, this is one. Yeah, just a useful fact, um, and we. There are, it's, here is another statement, another lemma. It's kind of interesting. It was not that useful, but still, uh, uh, it's also valid for all D. It shows that uh, uh, the coning operation, which uh, I'm sure you are familiar with, the uh, 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 fundamental coning theorems of. Uh, 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 Walter Whiteley and also uh, Bob Connelly and Walter Whiteley, um, and and there is also a, a version for for high 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 redundancy. Interesting thing is that uh, uh, if you have a k vertex rigid graph, and we look at the cone, then then we have a we obtain a k edge rigid graph in in R D plus one. And similarly, uh, coning transfers or I mean, slightly changes the uh, the redundancy. Uh, it uh, transfers uh, k vertex, uh, say, global rigidity to k edge global rigidity in in R d plus one. 
but sometimes this 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 general cooling lemma can be used to find uh, uh, constructions. And maybe one more uh, observation. It's really easy. This is uh, one uh, uh, family of lower bounds, which is the uh, simplest one, and it was also found by by yeah, other people uh, in the in the previous papers. It's simply a, a minimum degree bound. So every rigid graph in RD on at least D plus one vertices has minimum degree at least D. Globally rigid graphs have minimum degree at least D plus one. So if we have a K vertex or K edge uh, rigid graph, for example, then since it must stay rigid, even if we remove up to k minus one edges or or vertices, then if we just focus on the on the neighborhood of a vertex, then then we can deduce that the minimum degree of such a graph must be at least uh, d plus k minus one, obviously, and this gives the uh, this lower bound for the edge number. And the same, there is a similar bound for for global rigidity. Um, <clears throat> Okay, but as I so, in some cases uh, the degree lower bounds can be attained, but in some other cases they are they are too weak, and then we have to uh, uh, determine uh, other lower bounds. All right. So from now on, we shall focus on this uh, particular entry. This is our goal in the rest of the talk. Uh, determine the smallest number of edges in a three edge rigid graph on n vertices in R3. And of course, there is another uh, trivial lower bound here because rigid graphs have uh, at least three n minus six edges and hence three edge rigid graphs. So remember that uh, we, the, uh, we can delete up to two edges and maintain rigidity. So obviously every three edge rigid graph must have at least three n minus four edges. It's a, it's a different, uh, even, even a more obvious lower bound. And you will see, uh, you have already seen from, from uh, in this table that we can attain this bound. So uh, we want, we have to construct a family of, of graphs uh, with, with this property that uh, uh, every graph in this family has only two extra edges beyond the uh, 3n minus 6 uh, lower bound for minimal rigidity, but it must satisfy the, this property that we can remove any pair of edges and, and preserve rigidity. Now, what can we do about this? Uh, one strategy uh, uses results about uh, uh, triangulated uh, convex polyhedra. So here you can see a few examples uh, and a, a, a real one as well. So these are triangulated convex polyhedra and a famous result uh, by Cauchy from 1813 says that every triangulated convex polyhedra is rigid in three space and uh, there is also the uh, stronger version, I think it's due to uh, Dane, that every uh, triangulated uh, strictly convex polyhedron is infinitesimally rigid in R3, which implies, which implies that uh, the graph of the, such a polyhedron is rigid, is minimally rigid in R3. So the graphs of these polyhedra will be called triangulations. So we could also define triangulations by saying that a triangulation is a maximal planar graph uh, and maximal planar graphs. So planar graph maximal means that every face is a triangle and uh, basic facts about these graphs, they are three connected and they satisfy uh, that the number of edges is equal to three and minus six. Okay, so this old result and uh, the modern version, it, 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 it gives us a uh, nice family of minimally rigid graphs, the maximal planar graphs. And then, well, since we want uh, uh, you know, redundant rigidity, or in fact, three edge rigidity, we have, to, we have to add 
more edges to uh, our triangulation. And the triangulations with extra added edges, they are called braced triangulations. So if you look at this figure, then you can see one bracing edge in, in the middle. So it's simply, it's a, a super graph of a maximal planar graph. A triangulation plus some extra edges. And now we are, one may, one may observe that, that there is a nice uh, conjecture by Walter from, from 88, which, um, which gives a, um, I mean, the truth of this conjecture would, would, would imply or desired three N minus four bound because the conjecture says that every five connected braced triangulation with at least two bracing edges is three edge rigid. So if you have a five connected braced triangulation with exactly two bracing edges, then it has three N minus four edges in total and it is three edge rigid. So then it's, a, it's, a, um, it's an extremal graph. It's an extremal graph. So um, it's kind of uh, uh, encouraging, but this conjecture is, is still open. It's still open, we don't, we don't know. Um, but the nice, uh, I mean, uh, the good news is that in order to solve this extremal problem, um, we don't have to solve this conjecture. We have to, we have to verify this conjecture uh, for an infinite family of uh, five connected braced triangulations that, that will do. Um, okay, so related result that we shall also use is a theorem that, that we proved with uh, Shinichi Tanegawa uh, uh, two years ago, um, that every four connected braced triangulation with at least one bracing edge is globally rigid and hence two edge rigid because globally rigid graphs are two edge rigid. So here it's not what we want, it's just a two edge rigid, but at least it's, um, it um, may be useful. So four connectivity instead of five connectivity, but only two edge rigidity. So let me mention that actually we, we conjecture, we have an even st stronger conjecture uh, stronger than Walter's conjecture. It's not related to this talk, but uh, I just wanted to mention that, in fact, we believe that every five connected braced triangulation with at least two bracing edges is two edge globally rigid. But we don't need this. Okay. So our goal, our goal, as I said, is to verify Walter's conjecture for an infinite family. And then we can, we can use another uh, interesting set of results. Namely, namely we turn to a, a, a triangulated polyhedra with blocks and holes. So instead of a formal definition, here you can see on the left you have a, a triangulation and on the right you have a triangulation with two holes and two blocks. So we obtain the holes by removing edges so in this case, we have removed two edges and we obtain blocks by adding edges so that we make the union of some neighboring faces rigid. In this case, we have two uh, blocks of size four. And another uh, interesting uh, story here is whether one can characterize the rigidity of uh, uh, polyhedra or triangulations with blocks and holes. And uh, the complete answer is still not known, but luckily, uh, uh, Jim, uh, Derek, and Steve, they solved an, um, an, an interesting special case. Uh, namely, um, they considered block and hole graphs, or block and hole, uh, okay, block and hole graphs with a single block. And in this case, they characterized minimal rigidity. They, they, they proved that, uh, uh, such a, a single block, many hole uh, graph is minimally rigid if and only if it satisfies the so-called girth inequalities that I will not define. Um, and this result, this theorem is a, an, an extension of uh, the, uh, some basic first results by uh, Wendy and, and Walter. So they solved the one block, one hole case. And uh, now we have a result for the single block, uh, many hole case. Okay, so this is what we can use. And now let me uh, show you the construction. 
So this is what we do. We pick a five connected triangulation and then add two edges so that we create a five block. You can see in the middle that after adding the dotted edges, we have a uh, K5 minus an edge subgraph, which is rigid in, in three space. So we have a five block and, um, and no holes. So triangles are not considered holes. Uh, okay, so it's a, it's a one block, uh, no hole configuration. It's obviously rigid because uh, uh, triangulations are rigid. So we call this extended graph G plus. And we proved with, with Chris and Ryan that this G plus is uh, a three edge rigid for every five connected uh, uh, triangulation. We can do this construction and obtain a three edge rigid graph. Why is that? The proof is not so short, but let me briefly give you a proof sketch. So, so, so we have to show that G plus, the extended graph minus E minus F is minimally rigid for all pairs of edges. So for every edge pair, G minus EF is minimally rigid. Now, case one, this is the lucky case. So if the edges are disjoint from this five block that we have created, then you can, you can observe that if we remove two edges, which are disjoint from the five block, then we create a one five hole, if E and EF belong to the same face, or two four holes. So then we have a, a single block two hole configuration, and then we can apply the block and hole theorem and use five connectivity to argue that uh, that uh, G plus minus EF is, uh, is, is minimally rigid, is rigid. Now the second case is, is, uh, uh, is a bigger problem because if these edges are not disjoint from the five block, then what we get, so then G plus minus EF is no longer a, um, a block and hole graph or a triangulation or whatever, they, then it, it is a bit messy. But in this case, we can perform some local reduction operations near the block, and then we can apply the braced triangulation theorem or the block and hole theorem to show that the uh, reduced smaller uh, structure or graph is rigid. And then we restore the rigidity. We obtain G plus minus EF by using local operations, vertex addition, edge splitting. So here indeed we need uh, every tool that we have, even uh, X replacement, of course, uh, special cases of X re replacement that, that work and the vertex splittings, even Walter's uh, second uh, type of vertex splitting is used. But with all these local operations, we can show that uh, G plus uh, minus EF is indeed rigid. So this is the conclusion here. Uh, if G is a strongly minimal three edge uh, rigid graph on at least 10 vertices, then uh, the number of edges is three V minus four. And the lower bound on N is due to the fact that the smallest five connected triangulation is the graph of the uh, icosahedron. Uh, but for every N at least 10, there is a five connected triangulation. Uh, so this uh, leads to one single entry in this infinite matrix, but luckily uh, one uh, can, uh, yeah, <laughs> one, can, one can fill in the matrix by, by solving finitely many uh, sub-problems. Um, so quickly, uh, open problems. Uh, so remember, we had four uh, epsilons in this matrix, uh, four vertex rigidity and so on, three vertex global rigidity, two vertex global rigidity. These are the, uh, 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 the almost tight numbers and the most difficult one seems to be the first one. So, so uh, four vertex rigidity in three space. This, this is probably the, the tough one. For the uh, third and fourth uh, item, we, we have a, a, I mean, we have a conjectured uh, uh, optimum and the corresponding family of graphs. But the first one is tough. And uh, here you can see the, uh, the, uh, this uh, bonus uh, item that actually uh, from the algorithmic point of view, these problems are also open. So even in the plane, uh, we, do, we do not know the status of the, the, uh, this uh, optimization problem, uh, how to compute the edge or vertex redundancy of a graph in the plane. Uh, 
there is no known polynomial time algorithm. Okay, sorry for the extra time. I think I should stop. Thank you. Thank you, Tibor. It's a really interesting talk. Does anyone have a, a question for Tibor? So, so while people are thinking, mm -hmm. I'll ask the, the obvious question. If you go up to arbitrary dimension, how much of the table or the matrix that you, you have can you fill in just for, for free? Um, yeah, good point. Good point. So, in, in uh, so Victoria and Chaba, they have. Uh, considered the d-dimensional case and they determined the uh the uh what is it okay two vertex rigidity two vertex rigidity in in rd this is the solved special case no other results are known uh, i have some other results but i'm pretty Chaba, pretty Chaba pretty thinks pretty. that he has some further results yeah, work, so, in, work so, in progress yes so i i know that the this uh, lower band, which was mentioned by Tibor for large values of k, is uh, is the optimum. So it's 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 tight uh, when k is at least about d square. So yeah, sorry, I, sorry. I can yeah. prove it for for such large values of k. But, yeah. Uh, so the right side of the matrix, the infinite part is uh, <laughs> probably is field. Uh, uh, field. Yeah. Yeah. 